Hi, everybody in Humanities 107. Good to see all of well, I can't see you, but presumably you can see me, or at least have the audio for this on in the background, so it's good to be back in contact in some form or another. Uh, hope you all had a pleasant spring break as far as that exists uh, in this uh, strange time that we are living in. And overall, we will do our best to get back into the swing of things. Uh, I did want to cover a little bit of class-related business at the top here, uh, just to make sure everybody's on the same page as far as that goes. Um, for right now, we are just going to keep on rolling with the way class has been structured in the those couple of weeks before spring break began. Um, we will do the weekly discussion boards, keep up with the readings, these video lectures, that sort of thing. And I did want to mention part of the reading for this week is actually another uh, video essay that's posted on YouTube. I believe I've already uploaded it, the link onto Brightspace. It's called The Adorkable Misogyny of the Big Bang Theory, and I'll kind of circle back to that later, but just want to make sure everybody knew that watching that was part of the assignment for this week, as it were. Uh, now, beyond that, uh, it has probably not escaped your notice that we haven't had uh, an essay uh, since I think the last one was in February, if I'm recalling correctly, I had been like right on the verge of creating an essay for you as the world got upended a month ago. And then with the transition online, it just didn't feel like the time was right to throw a long-term writing assignment at you. Uh, so with that interruption at such an odd time, uh, I we're just going to keep on with what we have right here uh, with the discussion board comments in these uh, the month that remains to us uh, before the end of the semester. But there is obviously going to be a formal writing assignment, uh, a final essay, and a, uh, th those are the same thing, a final essay and a final exam uh, that'll be due at the end of the semester, which is just under a month from now. Uh, so I just wanted to mention that. I'll try and put the assignment prompt for the final essay up on Brightspace. Uh, I'll try to do that this week. I uh, should get it uh, posted by hopefully Wednesday, Thursday, something like that. Um, Maybe this is the case for all of you as well, but I've actually been finding that it is harder to get work done to some degree while I'm working from home. I, I think part of it is just having young kids, but also trying to stretch myself between two different jobs and all of those things. Uh, it, it's just, it's a lot. It's a lot, as I'm sure you know. And so um, I should have that created in the next couple of days here. Uh, but basically, it, it's going to be a research essay exploring one of the, using one of the topics we've caught, talked about over the course of the semester as the overall, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? This is the problem with doing these things after you've been watching kids all day. Uh, you'll be, you'll be picking your own specific topic within the broader, uh, overall subjects that we've talked about over the course of the semester, doing some research and some critical semiotic analysis. Um, all of the details for that, uh, explaining this better than my stumbling through just now, will be up on Brightspace later on this week, and it'll, the assignment will actually be structured in two different phases. There's going to be a proposal phase where you uh, submit short writing assignment to me, just telling me what your topic is, what your thesis statement is, giving me the bibliography, the works cited for, uh, of the research you've done. And, and then providing an outline for the uh, overall structure of the argument in your final essay. Uh, all of that will be laid out in the assignment sheet, but just want to mention the proposal will be due probably something like two weeks from now, and then the final essay will be due the end of the week of final exams, which, like I said, is just under a month from where we are. And then the final exam will be a lot like the midterm exam was, uh, where we will... Uh, uh, I'll upload it onto Brightspace and you can take the test through there. And um, yeah, that'll be a grade, along with all the other stuff we've been doing, of course. So if you have any questions about that, um, well, <laughs> you can always hop into a Zoom meeting. You can always email me. If you've got specific questions about the final essay, 
hang on until I can get the uh, the actual assignment sheet created. But uh, yeah, I should be able to do that in the next couple of days here. All right, so moving past that stuff, our topic for this week in class is television, which goes hand in hand with the topic we had been discussing right before spring break, which was American movies. Movies and TV are... Not exactly the same thing, of course, but in terms of cultural analysis, they provide a lot of similar material. You can approach them in a lot of similar ways, and I think they provide similar insights when it comes to reflecting American culture back at us. Now, the particular way I want us to think about television here has to do with, um, with that reflection. I was just mentioning, I think that's the right way to phrase this. Television is a, probably second only to the internet, which is our next major topic, as a major form of communication and entertainment uh, in American society. A lot of that depends on circumstances, age brackets especially, might see differences there. Older folks might watch more TV than younger folks, though maybe... Maybe it's just different types of TV that are watched between different age brackets, that sort of thing. Uh, regardless, people watch a lot of TV in the United States, both in its traditional format uh, and, as well as in new streaming platforms like Netflix, Disney+, Plus, these sorts of things. So obviously it is well worth taking a look at what we're watching, why we respond to it, and what those things have to say about us. Uh, the messages in them that we respond to and which tell us a lot about ourselves. And on that note, uh, I actually, what I really want us to explore in the discussion board this week has to do with issues of who we're seeing on TV and what we're seeing on TV. And why don't I start with the who thing? Um, this is actually something that I, there's not a formal reading about in the textbook, which is fine. It's a sort of simple concept, but it's a very powerful concept that I want you to think about with any TV you're watching over the course of this week. Uh, it's an old old, it's created in the 1980s, a concept called the Bechdel test. B-E-C-H-D-E-L. Bechdel. This is created by a uh, female cartoonist back in the 1980s, Alison Bechdel, who actually created a really great graphic novel called Fun Home a couple of years ago. Um, and it was, I don't know how serious it even was, but within one of her comic strips, a, a female character said that she wasn't interested in going to see some new movie because it didn't pass her test. Her test was, does this movie have two female characters who have a conversation with one another, just one conversation, about something other than a man? If a movie had two women who talked about something other than a man, even once, it passed the Bechdel test. Which is, feels like a pretty low bar. Feels like it's a pretty low bar. Apparently not. As far as movies go, uh, we're pretty putrid at it. I, I don't know the last year I saw exact statistics for, but generally speaking, only about one-third of American movies pass the Bechdel test. They have a scene where two female characters talk about something other than a man, because typically speaking, male characters are the central protagonist, the lead character, the hero, whatever the case may be. The antagonist is often male as well. When female characters appear, they are often in supporting roles which are disconnected from one another. Think of uh, so two of the more, uh, we were talking about archetypes uh, in movie lingo, uh, these very familiar, familiar types of characters. Two of the most familiar ones for women are the good mother, uh, a helpful, nurturing female mother, you get the idea. You get what I was saying. There. Or the uh, romantic interest. The mo romantic interest could wind up being a good or bad love interest, depending on the story that's being told. But generally speaking, the good mother and the love interest, they don't interact with each other very often in American storytelling. They interact with the male lead, the son slash romantic hero. Uh, and so that means uh, this movie might have two female characters, a hypothetical one that's in my head here, uh, but it doesn't have the female characters interact. They're not centralized. They're not made central. Uh, I should say, to the story, and they're not given agency within the story. They exist to revolve around the male character rather than be their own independent, free-willed person. Um, 
so this is an issue that you see in American movies as well as in American television. Um, and, and I want to point out a couple of quick things here about the Bechdel test. Number one, this is not a fail-safe way of measuring representation or agency or anything like that when it comes to depiction. Uh, think of something like Sorry to Bother You. I, thinking back on it, I don't think Sorry to Bother You passes the Bechdel test for women. I'd have to think through it again, but I don't believe there's a scene where two female characters have a conversation with each other about something other than men. I honestly don't know that I really recall scenes with more than one female character in them at a time. At least not speaking. That says something, right? It doesn't say everything. I, I do think you could point to Sorry to Bother You as a uh, strong example of representation when it comes to issues like class and race. Uh, but for gender, maybe it fails. And that's not a condemnation necessarily, but it is an observation that is perhaps indicative about the people who made it, about the message they were sending. There's a lot of different ways you could read that. But I do want to say there are movies that I think are you know, movies and TV, we're talking TV, uh, that are, uh, that, that do represent diverse voices, voices that are not just this guy. Um, that maybe don't pass the Bechdel test. So it's not a fail-safe, but it is useful. The other thing I wanted to mention about the Bechdel test is that you can adapt it. I, I, I've done this in class before. The original version of this asks about gender. Do two women have a conversation about something other than a man? You could easily ask it about race or ethnicity. Are there two people of color who have a conversation about something other than a white person? Uh, you could ask it about sexuality uh, or gender identity. Are there two LGBT characters who have a conversation about something other than a straight or heteronormative uh, or uh, or cisgendered person? Uh, you can even you could even like I said, uh, how, sorry to bother you. Talked about class a lot. You could look at this from a class angle? Are there two working class people who have a conversation about something other than a middle class or upper class character? I, that's probably relatively rare in American television and movies, right? So the Bechdel test, it can provide a very interesting perspective on whose story is being told, who is in this story, and what their story, uh, and, and what power or agency the characters have in the story. Now, I want to, so that's one of the discussion board topics for this week. The other thing I wanted us to think about here and how television can, can maybe affect us or send messages to us is a, a discussion here about what TV normalizes for us. TV is something we consume a lot of. I've had students kind of do this in the past where they track how much they're consuming different forms of entertainment and popular culture. And TV tends to gobble up a lot of time. Oftentimes you don't even re realize it. That's the binge watching that's so popular, right? So because this is constantly around us, the things we see on TV tend to feel as real as reality itself, if that makes a certain amount of sense. There's a lot of um, writing and research, which seems to indicate that people inherently believe what they see on TV to be true, even if it is fiction. If you watch uh, the news, for example, you can very easily be persuaded, not that this is necessarily something the news is trying to do, but the news covers a lot of crime, right? A lot of, you know, murders, robberies, mayhem, etc., if all you do is watch the news and all you hear about is crime, you might perceive that there's an enormous crime problem in the United States. And it's not to say that there's not, but crime rates right now are near historic lows. The murder rate, especially a violent crime rate, has fallen off a cliff since the early 1990s. But you might not guess that if you watch the news. Uh, similarly, if you watch a lot of very popular TV programs, you might get a strong sense that we live in a very dangerous world. If you watch CBS... For example, they've got endless runs of shows like NCIS and Criminal Minds and SWAT and SEAL Team that are all about powerful police and military figures running around the world, killing bad guys and protecting American innocents. They're compelling adventures, but if that's all you watch, you probably have a strong sense that, holy shit, there's a bunch of evil, horrible, terrifying people out there, and if not for these powerful authority figures, I would be in danger. 
I have some problems with the politics of that, as you might be able to guess. And so that's something that I think is interesting to note. Now, um, that being said, you can look at this in a lot of different angles and perspectives, and the readings for this week provide a couple of different examples of that. I wanted to focus in particular on uh, two different ones uh, towards the end of my lecture here. The first of them comes from one of the lectures here uh, in the textbook. It's called The Social Networks, uh, and the author in there talks about how friendship is depicted on television. I actually thought this is a fascinating thing to read in the midst of the coronavirus lockdown, because she talks about how friendship and relationships on TV are rarely reflective of how we all relate to one another in real life. I, in, in person, amongst my close friends and family, I have seen my wife and my kids and no one else for a month. I've done video chats, that sort of thing. Uh, but that's not seeing people in quite the same way, right? And, and, you know, this is out of the norm during the lockdown because we literally can't go see other people. But even before then, like, personally speaking, and maybe my own personal experience is a little off here, I you know, I saw my friends now and then, but not a ton. And seeing all of my friends at, like, some big get-together, that happens, like, three times a year. That's, like... I don't know, Memorial Day, 4th of July, my birthday, and New Year's Eve. Those are like the four times that my wife and I have a bunch of friends over. Maybe we're just a bunch of homebodies and we don't get out and we don't get to see people very much. I'm sure our friends might say that. But if you watch popular TV comedies, that would look really bizarre. Uh, one of the essay, the video essay and one of the written essays this week is about the Big Bang Theory, which is about an apartment where seemingly people hang out, just socialize, all the time, constantly, every day, 24-7, popping in and out of each other's apartments in order to hang out, play board games, chit-chat, all of this sort of thing. And, like, that sounds great. I would love to see my friends, but, like, I also have to take care of my kids, and I have work obligations, like recording this video. I have to do the dishes. I have to clean the house. I have multiple jobs I have to run around. Sometimes I just, I don't want to see people. Sometimes I just want to sit on the couch and play video games. And, like, that's that's real life. That's not compelling television, though. And so television shows like The Big Bang Theory, like How I Met Your Mother, like Friends, um, they depict a much more social world than reality actually holds. Uh, the, the author of that piece says that you know, on TV show friendship doesn't come in pairs, it comes in flocks. That's rare. But if that's all you watch, it might make you look at your own social life and ask, well, why am I unpopular? Am I not normal because I only see my friends now and then? Should I have people over here 24-7? No, but you you get why you might feel that way, right? Uh, and speaking of the Big Bang Theory, like I said, there's both a video essay to watch and a reading about it. And I think the Big Bang Theory is a really interesting one as well because it's a show that I doubt its creators thought... <sighs> I don't want to underestimate people, but I have a feeling the creators of the Big Bang Theory did not think terribly deeply about the politics. And I don't mean partisan politics. I mean, like, the ideological content, perhaps, of what they were creating and what they were producing. But their show was tremendously popular. That show was near number one in the ratings for about a decade. Uh, and it very much regular, uh, uh, normalized, I should say, two particular mindsets that I think are not great. One of them is misogyny. That video essay that I mentioned really delves into the fact that the show is cruel towards women. The female characters on it are regularly abused by the male characters, and even the friendly male ones exhibit a lot of anti-social, harassing, aggressive behavior that in real life would be cause for genuine alarm, but on the show, it's all just presented as a big, funny joke, and we should all, uh, you know, laugh our heads off at Leonard being sexist. And, like, the show kind of structures it so that you're laughing not with Sheldon, but at Sheldon, but also Sheldon was the most popular character. He got the spin-off. Like, on some level, the show agreed with him. That's, that's problematic, right? Uh, the other one, this is from the reading, talks about how the show 
it, it sets itself up as a satire of what it's called what it calls scientism that the main characters on there all uh all see, sorry if you're hearing the background noise there my dog is in the room with me and apparently she would like to leave but i'm not going to pause the recording to do that so you just get to hear zoe moan from a few feet away uh, but scientism is the belief that scientific practice or theory is the best way to understand the world which is largely true like if we want this lockdown to end science is going to have to do that for us. But the show presents these guys maybe over the top and unfairly as if they had no social skills at all. And by doing that imply that science itself is antisocial, that it lacks common sense, that it, that the people behind scientific inquiry and scientific discoveries are wrong on some level. They might get the big ideas right, but they are idiots when it comes to real life. And that can decrease trust in things like, oh, I don't know, vaccines or public pronouncements that you have to stay at home in order to remain healthy and not kill people. And again, I don't think the creators of the Big Bang Theory intended that, but that is one of the messages, one of those connotations that the show presented. That again, is a problem to a degree. And it's it's one of those things where I think it's worth looking at the shows you watch and asking, what is the connotation of this? What is this normalizing for me? I think particularly something like Tiger King, which everybody on Twitter talked about when Netflix released that last week, um, that has a ton of connotations to it that are maybe not the healthiest, but the show itself doesn't pause to point out that fact. All right. I've been rambling a little bit here. Uh, I think that's all I've got for you this evening. Let me know if you have any questions, of course, popping into Zoom or email, and I will see everybody on YouTube next week.